Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U, online instruction. Welcome to module three. Now, if you recall, in the last module, what I did was we talked about this temperature-driven current. That is, currents where the two contacts not only have a voltage across them, that's this mu1 minus mu2, but also could have a temperature difference. And what we showed is that starting from the same basic expression from week one and using the same linear approximation, you could now have an additional term here, which would give you a certain coefficient, this g sub s. And as we explained, what is experimentally measured usually and what is generally quoted all over the literature is the Seebeck coefficient, which is actually the ratio of gs to g. And that's what we kind of summarized here. That is, this expression with a little rearrangement can be written in this form. And what we have seen is that how g is obtained, this is something we did back in week one. And if you want gs, you do much, the expression looks much the same, except that you have this additional factor there now, e minus mu over qt. And this factor, however, interestingly, actually changes sign at e equals mu, and thereby can actually give you two different signs for gs. And that is the physical thing that you had mentioned before, that there are two types of conductors, some of which have a positive gs and some have a negative gs. Now, what I want to explain today is a related effect called the Peltier effect. Now, let me explain what that is about. Now, earlier I had once mentioned that in these small conductors, if you ask the question that when you have a resistance, where is the heat generated? Because with every resistance, when the current flows, there is an I squared R. That's the heat. Question is, where is this heat generated? And in the early days of nanoelectronics and mesoscopic physics, that was one of the important conceptual issues that bothered people. Because if an electron goes directly from one contact to another without exchanging energy with the surroundings, then it is hard to see how heat could be generated. And the present understanding is that of in these small conductors, the heat is largely generated in the contacts. And how do you understand that? Well, the basic idea is once the electron is here, it has an energy that's up here. And of course, in this contact, because the electrochemical potential is down here, these states are supposed to be nearly empty. So the fact that you have some extra electrons there is a non-equilibrium situation. And so what the contact does is it immediately through various complicated processes, processes that we are not even discussing, but, we, but what they do is they quickly restore this to equilibrium. So what that means is the electron that was at this energy E will, through all these complicated processes, end up at mu2 down here. And so effectively, it will have given up this amount of heat to the surroundings. Hmm, let me use a better pen, it will have effectively given up that heat to the surroundings here. On this side, if you look, what you'd see is, well, there was this empty spot left behind, and new electrons from here will come in and fill it up. And again, it will give up that much energy, mu1 minus E, to this contact. So that's how some of the heating takes place here, and some of the heating takes place here. Now, with the same picture in mind, think of what would happen if you were having current flow through a n-type conductor. So supposing, instead of this, I now draw something up here. In a way up there. I've kind of exaggerated things a little. And let us talk about electrons that come across at this energy. Now I might say, well, that's, that energy is way higher than mu1. And that's true. At low temperatures, there wouldn't be any electrons here. 
but we are talking about say room temperature, which means there are electrons up here, up to a, you know, a few like 10, 20, 30 milli electron volts above mu. So there are electrons here that flow, of course, because kT is 25 millivolts at room temperature. And the point is there is these electrons that will go from here to there. And once they come here, they will dissipate that much energy. So this is the heat that will go out, E minus mu 2. That's fine. But the interesting thing is at this end, here you see an empty spot was left behind. And the electrons from this equilibrium pool actually have to climb in energy to get there. So how do they climb? Well, they have to take heat from the surroundings. And that is a process by which essentially this contact would get cooled, you see. And this is the principle of this thermoelectric refrigeration, essentially, that when you have a conductor like this, every time an electron goes from left to right, one contact gets hot, sure enough, but the other contact actually gets cooled, which means if you were to place your favorite soft drink, whatever that is, on this contact, that's where all the heat would come from. That's where it would be absorbing the heat from and that's where it would cool that thing down. And that's what I said is the principle of this ref thermoelectric refrigeration. And this is what's generally known as the Peltier effect. And the point is that this is something that accompanies the Seebeck coefficient. So any material that gives you a Seebeck coefficient will also have a corresponding Peltier coefficient. The two should be related. And what I'll try to do next is do this thing quantitatively and get an expression for this coefficient of this Peltier effect and we'll see that how that's related to the Seebeck coefficient. And you'll notice that these are two very different physical things. Previously, we were talking about having a hot side and a cold side and the Seebeck coefficient told you what is the uh, open circuit voltage. Here we are saying, if we just run current through it, then it will naturally want to cool one side and heat the other side. They're totally different effects, but the coefficients that describe them are related in a fundamental way. A fact that actually was originally discovered experimentally. People measured those things, noticed this interesting relationship. Later on, they had thermodynamic arguments explaining why it is. And one of the nice things about our bottom-up approach is, as you'll see, that with this elementary description, we'll see the relationship between the two coefficients. It'll just fall out of it very easily. You know, results that are really fairly profound and took many, many years for people to realize and understand. Okay. Now, first thing we need though, before we go on, is an expression for the heat current. But I'm, so, so far, what we have written here is what's called the electron current. And what we want to write down is an expression for the heat current. So it will be something similar, but with a minor, with a small modification, and that's what I want to explain. And the basic observation is the following, that every time an electron goes from left to right, it takes an amount of heat E minus mu 1 from this contact and dumps an amount of heat E minus mu 2 at that contact. And if we are talking of small voltage differences, where mu 1 and mu 2 are very, are almost the same, then you could say that roughly speaking, you're taking E minus mu 1 and dumping the same amount over there. Actually, it's dumping a little more, but let's say mu 1 and mu 2 are almost equal, then you could say, well, it's basically dumping the same amount. So what that means is, Every time an electron flows from left to right, there's also a heat current that flows from left to right, the heat current of E minus mu. Every electron carries that much amount of energy, E minus mu, from left to right, taking E minus mu in from here and dumping it over there. So what that means is if I'm trying to write the heat current, you see, when I had the charge current, this told me how much charge was carried. So every electron was carrying an amount of charge Q. 
So if I take this and just divide it by Q, what I'll get is how many electrons are actually flowing per second. So what I had here is the charge current. I divide by Q, every electron carries a certain amount of charge Q, divided by that, so it tells me how many electrons per second are going across. And then I note that every electron that goes across carries an amount of heat E minus mu. So I could put that here. And that then will be my expression for the heat current through the system. So notice, it's exactly what we had in back in week one, but now I have added this new factor in here, the E minus mu over Q. And what we could do is start from the same expression, see, and linearize it, you know, like we discussed before. Again, do exactly what we did on this one. No difference, just the same. And what you'd get then is something that looks like a new coefficient here, GP, times mu1 minus mu2 over Q, plus a new coefficient here, I'll call it GQ, times T1 minus T2. And what will be GP and GQ? Well, you can go through the algebra. It would be the same kind of thing. You take F1, your basic idea again is take F1 minus F2, approximate it with this del F del mu times mu1 minus mu2 plus del F del T times T1 minus T2. You know, exactly what we did in the last module, we'd be doing much the same thing, replacing the same way. And at the end of it, you might expect that these new coefficients will be just like the old one, except for this new factor of E minus mu over Q, you see? So what you could do is, we, I could just revise these equations I had written earlier, if you look. You see, earlier I had these expressions for G and GS, now what I have is an expression for GP, and what it would be is whatever I had for G, but then multiplied by this new factor E minus mu over Q. That's all. So it's exactly what we had here multiplied by that. Similarly, for GQ, we'd have exactly what we had here, but multiplied by E minus mu over Q. So all I did was took the result from last time, multiplied by E minus mu over Q, and that gives me GQ. Take the result from conductance, multiply by E minus mu over Q. That's it. You see? And you could go through it the proper way, and this is what you'd finally get. So what this means is, this is what we had back in week one. Now we have three new quote-unquote conductance coefficients. The first two came from looking at the charge current. The second two came from looking at the heat current. And basically, they all have the same kind of expression, but you have something for GS, a new factor for GP, another different factor, and for GQ, yet another factor, okay? And these would be the formal expressions then for these different thermoelectric coefficients. Now, the expression we have then here, let me get it. Let me do one more thing, one more algebraic thing, and then we can move on. So, what we have is this is the regular current, electron current, and this is the heat current. Now, earlier I had mentioned that this is, it is more convenient to write this with the voltage on the left-hand side. We had done that earlier, if you remember. I still have this up on the blackboard here, if you notice, and I'll just write it here so you have that for reference. So you have delta V 
is equal to 1 over g times i minus g s over g delta t. So, this we had done earlier and I had explained this is the Seebeck coefficient. Now, same here, we still want the heat current, but rather than write it in terms of the voltage, it is more convenient to write it in terms of the current. What that means is instead of this delta V, what we could do is write 1 over G times I minus G S over G times delta T. And now you'll notice you have G P over G times I, which I can write here. minus another. Now, when you look at the delta t term, you'll see I got two terms. One is the delta t times gq, that's from here. And then there is this additional thing gp, gs over g. So, I can combine those two and write it as plus So, those are the two expressions there. So, if you look at it then, we looked at the full current expressions for current and heat current, linearized it, got an expression for linear expression for both of them, and you had this G, GS, GP, and GQ. But when comparing with experiments, what is more convenient is to have the voltage on the left hand side and have the current as the independent variable there. And same with when you're writing heat current, have the current on this side. So, this is the form that comes naturally from the theory, but these coefficients g, g, s, g, p, g, q, they don't really have a name or even this symbols are not standard. But here, everything has a name. This, of course, is the resistance. That's the Seebeck coefficient. This is the Peltier coefficient. Again, these are things, if you Google a material, you'll find information about the Peltier coefficient. What is it? Well, it's like if you had a material with no temperature difference across it, delta T is zero, then the ratio of the heat current to the regular current. So how much heat current is carried by a certain amount of current? That is what you'd call the Peltier coefficient. And the interesting thing you'll notice is the Peltier coefficient is GP over G, Seebeck coefficient is Gs over G. And if you look at our expressions from before that we had up here, if you look at these expressions, you'll see that, you'll see out here that Gs and G actually, Gs and G actually have a temperature between them. That is, when you look at Gs and Gp, this involves E minus mu over QT and GP involves E minus mu over Q. And so GP is equal to T times GS. And so this pi will be equal to T times S. This is the Seebeck coefficient, this is the Peltier coefficient, and this is the temperature. And this is an expression, as I said, had been earlier had been identified experimentally and explained using thermodynamics, thermodynamical arguments. But the point I was trying to make is our treatment, this just falls out naturally. The expression, the expressions we have, if you just use that, you'll get these answers. So this is the basic results really. What I'll try to do in the next module then is, we'll look at a, just a simple device. You know, imagine a device with just one level. And what I'll try to show you is how what these formal expressions would tell you. And what I'll try to show you is that in that case, you could almost write down these answers without going through the formal theory. And you can compare the two and thereby get a feeling for how the formal expressions work.